Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Uh, I think uh, Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of our lives, should be embraced by us all and, and enjoyed by everyone, and not thought of as some arcane discipline that takes place only in ivory towers. Before we get into our show today, I, I want to give a little plug uh, for science uh, being conducted around, around the world and by everyone. Uh, group SACNAS, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos, Native Americans in Science, is having their uh, national conference here in Honolulu uh, right around ha Halloween this year, uh, first couple days of November. And everyone should sign up for this. Uh, great opportunity to meet a bunch of interesting Interesting people. So anyhow, uh, today we, we have a guest. We're, we're uh, bringing her in from quite a distance, from uh, Quito, Ecuador, actually. Tracy uh, Tokuhama. Uh, welcome, Tracy. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. Well, great. We're happy, happy to have you. And Tracy uh, works uh, uh, with Harvard University, their extension school, teaching the neuroscience of learning and introduction to mind, brain, health, and education. So a, a wide ranging, uh, wide ranging topic they are. Uh, but, it's very broad, yeah. <laughs> but all deeply interlinked. You know, you can't, you can't really be, you can't have any one of those in, in without having some of the others sort of all balanced out, right? Exactly. This is the learning science in general, right? Psychology, neuroscience, health, and pedagogy. Mm -hmm. there, there we go. Excellent. And, and you have connections to Hawaii. Here, I guess your your father grew up here, right? And you you've visited a number of times. Excellent. Absolutely. Hawaii is my, my second home, and every Tokahama in the phone book is my relative. Oh, all right. Great. Got a lot of family here then. <laughs> yeah, I do. So we're going we're gonna to talk, uh, one, one of Tracy's many interests and areas that she has studied is that of sleep. And so we decided we, we would talk about sleep, because sleep is very likable. Everyone likes to sleep. Well, most people like to sleep. And it's accessible. So I thought, I thought we, we should explore this. So uh, everyone knows sort of what sleep is, right? But, but why do we sleep? <laughs> that's a great question, and that's just really the whole balance of human beings, right? It's very much the same of, um, if you think about uh, general uh, physical hygiene, you know, why do we keep our bodies clean? That we, we think about, we should think about sleep in the same way. Why do we need good sleep hygiene? So along with things um, as fundamental as eating, this is really one of the basics of life. So your body seeks to have this balance, and it's really achieved and, and facilitated by sleep and dreaming. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes makes sense. We spend something like a third of our lives sleeping, so we, we should we should do that well as we as we eat well, exercise well, as you say, keep ourselves clean. So, but sleep varies, right? Over over the lifespan, infants seem to sleep a lot. Adults, uh, kids maybe a little less. Adults still less, and a lot of elder, elderly folks seem to sleep even less. Is that is that a general trend, or am I misinterpreting things? Oh no, it's an absolutely yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. The, um, in fact, babies in, uh, or, or, or children in utero just before they're born sleep almost 24 hours, right? But newborns in general sleep up to um, 17 hours a day. Um, and there's a real curiosity with this because it sort of, it begins to go down. It slows down a bit around infants and toddlers, preschoolers sleep, you know, maybe 10 to 13 hours and teenagers will then need something between a nine uh, and, and uh, 11 hours would be what an average would probably need. Um, but you're right, as we get into older adulthood, um, we start to slow down and say, okay, we only need maybe seven to nine hours of sleep or so. But the older we get, you'll find that um, very old people will sleep um, in maybe five or six hours, which is not uh, too uncommon. And one of the theories is that there's a there's this beautiful bath of combination of neurotransmitters that occurs uh, during um, dreaming stage, during REM stage of sleep when most of the dreams occur. And basically there's a hypothesis, we don't know for sure, but there's a need for those, that balance of chemicals in order to develop the brain. Oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, the, the, we, we wouldn't sleep if there weren't some good biological reason for it, right? Uh, almost every animal, as far as I know, that's been looked at does sleep. Some sleep a little differently than others. There are birds that can actually stay aloft while they sleep. Uh, which and actually, and mammals are the only uh, animals that have REM sleep, that have uh, rapid eye movement, which is associated with dreaming. Huh. So there's always this theory or this wonder, do dogs dream or you know, do dolphins dream? And basically, uh, yeah, based on brain scans, you can see that they do similar um, sleep stages. 
and they think that REM stages is, is related to thermal regulation. So basically, you know, keeping your body in balance, knowing how to, you know, when to up the temperature or the heartbeat or whatever, that seems to be um, given a rest during REM state. So that's one of the reasons that we think or we know that mammals all dream. So you're right. Most animals will sleep, but only a few will dream. <laughs> interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So why is it that, that you, you point out that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently has, has declared basically that, that we have a national emergency because people aren't, aren't sleeping well, or aren't sleeping enough, or have sort of, as you put it, poor sleep hygiene? Yeah. Well, if you ask anybody around you, um, you know, do you sleep enough? And you can pretty much put your finger on the pulse of this general problem that we have. Um, very few people say, yeah, I sleep well all the time. Most people say that they could use more sleep than they get. And so they feel not rested. And, and basically, um, if they had to put a number to it within, um, there was a comparative study in the United States and also the UK, about a third of adults really don't get the amount of sleep they need. And so there's nobody dictating that you need eight hours of sleep because between four and a half and 12 is, is normal. Uh, eight is an average. Right. But um, if you're getting less than your normal, so say that you, know, you sleep you know, seven hours a night, but you start to sleep only six, you will have, you know, th there are consequences to that, right? But somebody else who might need 10 hours and then doesn't sleep, you know, they're only sleeping eight, they'll also have the same kinds of problems because they're not getting what they personally need. Right, and, and actually not getting sleep when you need it, I get it has just really amazingly deep and profound, long lasting, widespread effects. I was reading recently oh, yeah. that, that uh, the numbers of certain classes of your immune cells will crash if you simply you know, have one night where you get only like half your normal sleep and the next day, the, the, your immune system basically just dives, basically. And that's going yeah, to open you up to all kinds of illness. Yeah, you're stressing, you're generally stressing out your system. And so basically, you throw your defenses out of whack because certain uh, proteins, these are um, cytokines, they're, they're not produced um, as they should be. You know, your, your body is out of that balance that it seeks. And so because you don't do that, then your immune, your immune system is shot. But other consequences of poor sleep. Um, if you get sick, then people not sleeping well also has consequences for the economy. Uh, because if you don't sleep well, then you miss work, for example. Right. Or miss school if you're a kid, yeah, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, these, uh, and we've actually got a slide that I think shows a little bit of this. Uh, some, of the, some of the ways that, that sleep deprivation can, uh, here, can, can impact a lot of different systems in your body. Your immune system, yeah. they can cause, I guess, a, increase your risk of type 2 diabetes, increases your reaction times, you react more slowly, therefore you probably shouldn't be out for instance, driving your car when, you're, when you've missed the night's sleep. It increases your heart rate and variability, so you, you're, again, if you have heart problems, you may be worse. You know, impairs your judgment, uh, hurts memory. I mean, all kinds of sort of different different ways. So it, it's not all kinds of awful things. And there's some other terrible statistics that come out of the UK that show that there's like around a 13 percent higher mortality rate for people who don't uh, get at least six hours of sleep a night. Basically, because your judgment is impaired, you take higher risks, you don't measure things. Your attention span is limited. This is also another one of these spinoff effects. Is that uh, kids who don't sleep well enough can actually look like they have uh, ADHD. So we have this, uh, in the United States, we diagnose uh, about twice the number. We have an average, a national average of about 11% of kids have ADHD. But this is kind of strange because the whole rest of the world has an average of about 5%. And so there was a very interesting article, I believe it was the New York Times about 2013 or so, that says we're just basically diagnosing the wrong disease. We are um, mis we're, we're believing that kids have ADHD when what they really have is really bad sleep hygiene. They're just not sleeping well enough. Wow, that's, yeah, it's fascinating. I was actually reading an oddly parallel thing about there, there's a certain kids come down with psychoses very abruptly and are then treated for all these psychiatric disorders and are given drugs for psychiatric disorders. And it turns out a lot of it it's caused by an, a streptococcus infection, and in some small oh, percentage wow. of kids. The streptococcus infection apparently hits the brain and throws brain systems, you know, just wacky things. Kids start going delusional and 
Yeah, and it, you, know, you pop these kids on. But the this is the problem, right? In general, with diagnosis, diagnosis is half the cure, right? But we right. generally we find what we're looking for. So if you've got the wrong kind of professional. Um, trying to diagnose things like ADHD or whatever without beginning we we generally try to coach um, teachers parents to look at maybe the most fundamental things um, is the kid does he have a problem with sleep or, or bad nutrition um, and, and or you know is he stressed out unduly because the parents are getting a divorce or he fought with his friends or something can we start first with the physical maybe the psychological before you jump to saying, oh, it's probably ADHD, that's just something uh, neurophysiological. I mean, that's kind of crazy. So we try to coach people to start at the, at the ground floor of diagnosis because there are so many things that get misdiagnosed because we're looking for them right. rather than considering you know, the whole, the person as a whole. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a, whole, a whole huge other discussion we could obviously have about <laughs> diagnosis and problem solving in general. If you, if you, you know, it's yeah, very, yeah. very easy to solve the wrong problem typically. Uh, <laughs> You know, Einstein's famous dictum, right, when you're presented with a problem and you have an hour to solve it, you spend 55 minutes really defining that problem closely in the last five minutes you spend solving it. Exactly. Understand the instructions before right. you begin. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, okay, so what, what we've come up with to date is, is sleep's important. Uh, people, so why are we getting, why are we in this country, why are our kids, for instance, getting so they sleep so badly. I mean, is it they're sleeping too little? Are they? Is, is it too noisy? Are they up and about too much? Are they breaking their sleep into segments when they, when they shouldn't? What's what's the well, problem? Well, kids, it seems. Well, the average American, we have, uh, we've, we're sleeping about an hour less than we used to back in the '70s. So we've really decreased the general amount of sleep we get. And and for some adults, there are this hypothesis that that work schedules have changed. It's kind of interesting because the total number of work hours has decreased overall in society, but the greater number of you know 24 seven job possibilities has increased. So maybe the, uh, the way we're structuring our work worlds, but also, and you can't uh, take out of the equation this, uh, the temptation of uh, technology, you know, on-demand TV or uh, having your computer right next to you or being able to chat with your friends late at night. So one of the things we talk about with good sleep hygiene, especially with kids, is that, you know, your, your bed is meant to sleep in. And so there should not be any device uh, in your room. You should create spaces that are, that really permit you to have that high quality sleep experience. Yeah, and there's, there's a, lot, a lot of interesting research going on about, about makes for good sleep right and how that how it is uh something you sort of have to structure and set up how the lighting some some people have these theories about the color of the lighting before you go to sleep you don't, you don't want a lot of blue light before you go to sleep that's apparently sort of signaling your body to wake up and you, you much more want the, the redder end of the spectrum so i mean i don't know how much of this is, is has been well supported but but there's all kinds of interesting stuff now going on there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot of people who begin to make sleep research very popular. Um, Walker Payshot and you know um, uh, Alan J. Hobson are are some great uh, people who have done some really exceptional research lately, and they've called attention now in more popular press books um, about you know why do we sleep? Because a lot of people just sort of write off sleep, don't pay very much attention to it because they're not conscious while they're doing it, so they don't really understand why they sleep so what's the point is this a waste of time right um or and and now we're understanding the great you know impact that poor sleep habits have not only on the individual the immune system on our economics um but also you know just being a danger to yourself right there's greater risk taking when you haven't slept well you're, you have poor judgment just yeah. because you don't have your attention systems working well so we um we also know that there's this kind of a terrible cycle here that because we're sleepy then we drink caffeine but because we're so wired by caffeine then we need that drink at night to go to sleep but then because you went to sleep because of alcohol you'll probably wake up in about an hour and a half because you didn't go to sleep naturally and then you'll be, you know, you'll lie there awake and then you'll finally get to sleep, but then you're sleepy again the next morning. And so there's this un unending cycle unless we become more conscious of how we sleep well. And that's the big, I think one big take home message is that sleeping is a behavior. Right. You can learn to do it better. And we are, we are gonna explore that part more neat, deeply when we come back. Uh, I trust in this one minute break we're gonna take that not everyone will fall asleep. 
And they'll come back and join us in another minute. I'm uh, Ethan Allen, your host on Likeable Science. Tracy Tokumura is here uh, joining us from Ecuador, and we will be back in one minute. Aloha. I want to invite all of you to Talk Story with John Wahei every other Monday here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we have special guests like Professor Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii, who joins us from time to time to talk about the political happenings in this state. Please join us every other Monday. Aloha. <laughs> You recycle, right? Yep, it's confusing. It's hard for all of us to recycle properly when it's this confusing. Yet recycling is the number one thing we can do for the environment and the economy. If we do it properly, we have a solution. And it's working. The standardized labels help people recycle more, and they help people recycle right. Let's recycle across America, and let's recycle right. To be part of the standardized label solution, visit letsrecycleright.org. And thanks for joining us again here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me from uh, Quito, Ecuador, is Tracy Tokumura. Uh, welcome again, Tracy. Thank you. Tokahama. <laughs> Tokahama, sorry. Uh, I, I apologize. Uh, I must have been asleep, you know. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we've been talking about sleep and, and spent some time discussing the, the dangers and, and problems with poor sleep hygiene, as you, as you refer to it, bad sleep habits. Um, but you hinted in the, in the earlier part that, that, that sleep is not a unitary state. We go through these different stages and phases, and you, you referred to uh, rapid eye movement or REM sleep that I think some people probably have heard of, which is when we dream. I thought maybe we should uh, dig a little bit more into dreaming because dreaming is pretty, pretty more important than some people believe, right? Oh, yeah. Dreaming uh, is, is amazing, but REM stage of sleep is only about 25% um, of the total amount of sleep. And, and about 70 to 95% of your dreams actually occur in REM state. And so if you think about sleep in, in stages, and most people describe it as four stages, this, this is a measured by brain waves, the different types of brain activity. Um, we go through about four to five 90 minute cycles a night if you sleep this average of, of eight hours or so. And basically you go down into deep, deep, deep sleep and just before you wake up, you're in this rapid eye movement stage where you're actually having dreams. And if you're lucky enough to be able to wake up without an alarm, you're always waking up right out of that dream state. That's the most natural time to actually wake up. Right, and, and what's interesting is, I mean, some, some people, of course, remember their dreams, remember dreams very well, remember them very vividly, can recount them. Other people swear they don't dream at all, or they have only the very vaguest, hazy memories of their dreams. Again, I suspect some of this is, is learned behavior that you can- Oh, yeah, with, absolutely. With practice. Yeah. I'm, oh, yeah, people can learn to sleep better, and people can learn to wake up without alarms. Um, I always set an alarm, but I rarely ever need it. Usually I wake up about, you know, three, four minutes just before the alarm goes off because you can train yourself to do that. You just learn, uh, okay, this is the end of the dream stage and this is, and you do naturally wake up anyways. Um, there are little peaks of slightly waking up where you sort of roll over and then you go dig back into sleep. But basically um, you can train yourself to do this. And um, it is one of the most beneficial things um, for balance in life, for general well-being, um, and for learning. Um, uh, there's a huge role that um, dreaming uh, plays in consolidating memory, and there's a huge role for sleep for being able to pay attention. And attention and memory are the two big pillars for being able to learn things in the world. Right. And I, I understand there have been studies done where they, they interrupt people when they go into REM sleep basically break them out of their REM sleep. I don't know whether they knock them deeper or wake them up. And when they do that, it, after a little while, these people will begin to have very bad psychological effects on these people if they, if they can't do that REM sleep phase. Absolutely. You can probably, a uh, human being, the, the record is, uh, I think it's 11 days that you can keep somebody from sleeping, like in sleep stage. But you can only go about three days um, with keeping them out of dreaming. So you, this means you can allow them to go into deep sleep where their body is restoring and all this other stuff and it's very hard to wake them up. Um, but when, as soon as they begin to enter uh, REM stage, when they begin to enter a dream stage, if you wake them up, 
they can only handle about three days of that. And then after that, they go absolutely wacko. There's, um, I knew someone who did the sleep studies, which these days are actually not even ethical to do, but um, they, they woke him up and woke him up and woke him up on the third day. He literally picked up um, the chair that was in the room that he was being confined and threw it at the lab person who came in and curled up in a fetal position and went to sleep for about two days. So basically, basic then he went straight to REM. And this is what's also really interesting with um, even general college students that you do these studies on. When they're very sleep deprived, it's not really sleep deprived, it's really dream deprived. Yeah. They Instead of going down into deep sleep, they go straight into REM. And it yeah. seems to be because this bath of neurotransmitters, these chemicals are very, very important for maintaining that kind of um, sanity that we need. Yeah, no, it, it's very important things that, that are happening, obviously, and the, the, you're, you are, you're consolidating memories, you're, you're sort of cementing everything in place, you're probably sort of developing Sort of, it's like rebooting your computer in a sense, right? You're coming back to an even baseline to start up everything again. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's critically important. And if, uh, if you don't dream, if you're preventing, yeah, the, the effects are, are obviously bad. Why don't, why don't we go, we've got, we've got a second little image here of, of the stages of sleep, this, this uh, I think you call it a hypnogram, right? And this shows, mm -hmm. yeah, this shows somebody uh, a pattern of, of they actually have the, the four stages plus REM sleep actually shown on this one, but I'm mm -hmm. sure there's different ways of doing it, but the person drops in, swings back up to a REM sleep phase, drops back down in a very deep sleep, swings back up to REM phase, may actually wake up a couple of times during the course of a, of a night briefly. Yeah, and it, mm -hmm. so you, it, it's a, it's a uh, quite a, a different situation. So do right, and each of those stages is sort of is, that's what we label the differences in the brain waves, right? So the deeper right. you go down, the broader the waves, the slower the waves. Those are delta waves, right? right? So when you're wide awake, you know you're you're in a beta stage. But then you're about to go to sleep. That's when you're in alpha stage. So those people who do meditation or whatever are very familiar with the alpha mm -hmm. state just before you fall into sleep, mm -hmm. and you go into theta, and then you have. You, you deep dive into Delta, but then you come back up. So it's basically you're doing this right. wave um, yeah. over time, about 90 minute cycles, um, four or five times a night. And basically that's, uh, most of your dreams will occur then though in the REM stage. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it, it, uh, I, think, I think it's been pretty well established. Actually, everyone probably does dream. And, and it's just really a matter of some people remember their dreams better than others. Uh, Absolutely. Everybody does dream. Everybody must dream, believe it or not, because that's basically um, this, this longstanding hypothesis of why do people dream? And people might remember good old Freud who had these ideas of suppressed feelings, right? But some of the more modern thinkers, for example, Hobson at Harvard thinks that dreaming is used to rehearse emotions. Um, so basically, it's the safe space where you can you know, approach somebody or talk to somebody or react in a different way. And so he has this theory that um, that's the space that humans use to rehearse emotions, which I, I kind of like as a theory because um, in one of the classes he taught, he basically said, um, I don't care what you dream, just tell me how you felt in the morning and let me know if that influenced your, your feelings throughout the day. And it's true, these ang anxiety kind of feelings that you might have with some dreams, um, they do spill over into your day. Like you can have a pretty rotten day if you've had pretty rotten dreams. And so that's another reason why you should try to learn to manipulate them. You know, how do you choose what you dream? That's one of the, another very cool things about dreaming being a behavior. You can choose what you want to dream. It's pretty much your, it's up to you. You know, you're not, they don't come from anything else except for your own brain and your own choices. Right, and so, okay, that, 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 this actually is a great thing that I want to actually get to is how do we improve our, our sleep hygiene? How do we learn to sleep better? And one thing is, you know, learn sort of, it's not necessarily lucid dreaming, which is, which is the phenomenon of knowing you're dreaming while you're dreaming, but, but it, it is a taking control of your dreams. It, it's a learning how to, how to dream well, right? And that's certainly one part. Uh, there's certainly something about getting very regular sleep cycles that's also pretty important to, to sleeping and dreaming well, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And since we saw there on that graphic where you see that the dream stage is really uh, only about 25% of the total time in, that you're asleep. 
So if you if you're good at math, you know that um, well, if twenty five percent of the time you're in in REM. Um, the likelihood of your alarm clock going off at the right, right. time is pretty low. Right. You got like a seventy five percent chance that it's going to go off when you're in in a, in a deeper sleep stage, which right. will you know make you feel groggy all day long. So no. part of the idea is helping people understand and learn how to wake up naturally out of the dream state. And there are, believe it or not, um, these days there's an app for everything, isn't there? So right. there are things on your on your phone because your phone has a microphone, it, it can detect your own sleep stage. So when you're dreaming, you tend to be moving around, right? And and and, and very, you know, active you're, you're for when you're asleep. But when you go out of dreaming, you go into deep sleep and that's the time where you barely, you, you don't move at all. And like somebody tries to wake you up and you, you don't move, right? So, your telephone, well, this app, Sleep Cycle, basically figures out your sleep stage by measuring those sound waves. And you just say, you know, the latest I can wake up tomorrow is 6 a.m. And so what does the app do? It sets your alarm for as close to the natural moment you're finishing the dream stage before you go down into deep sleep again. So basically, you um, you wake up right out of a dream stage, which would be the most natural way uh, to wake up in any case. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. I mean, I recently I I haven't now for the last year or two I haven't set an alarm at all. I just wake up and I wake up pretty much at the same time every every morning. I go to bed at the same time each night. Wake up at the same time each morning, and you know, it works well. And it's because of the regularity of you. You feel that you've given yourself a a, a pattern, a good time, a normal time to go to sleep, and normal time to wake up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, and I have plenty of time. I I have about a nine hour period, which I figure probably eight hours are probably sleeping but uh, yeah it's it's works for me and uh, anyhow um, and yes of course people try to take uh, sleeping pills and other things too which of course are going to disrupt these cycles and push you in the wrong place and not be helpful in the long run but you know, drugs and alcohol do that yeah for right. sure and we, we could go on forever and ever on this conversation and we could put our audiences to sleep, I'm sure, but uh, I'm told <laughs> our, we are, our time is basically up. Uh, Tracy, it's been wonderful having you here. I want to get you back on the show again and we can, we can discuss more sleep or we can go into other uh, areas of your expertise, of which there are many. So uh, thank you very uh, much my for, pleasure. for joining. Thank you very much for the invitation, Ethan. Okay. And thank you for joining us on Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope to see you again next week. Till then.